Behold, the genius Lanny Popper, the world's smartest man. Sometimes what goes on behind the scenes is stronger than the soap opera on the video school. Hi gang, this is Mean Gene Okerlund. Welcome to the Genius Cast with Laddie Popple and J.P. Zarka. Both, as you know, are very dear, close, personal, longtime friends. Ladies and gentlemen, the poet and limerick writing, motivational speaking brother of WWE Hall of Famer Randy Savage, the genius, Leaping Lanny Poffo! Hello again, wrestling fans. This is Lanny Poffo, and this is my very good friend, JP Zarka, ProWrestlingStories.com, and you know, we were getting a lot of great feedback from the last couple weeks of episodes. I'm just so glad that when I say, here's my very good friend, and you're on the other end because you do all the work, you do so great, and uh, the fans really appreciate the glossiness of our production. You can't beat first class. I appreciate that, Lanny. I mean, having Sean Waltman on our show last week was a privilege. I mean, I was a huge fan of his when I was a kid. You guys should really go back to listen to last week's show, and we also included an interview with the man by the name of Jonathan Dobbs. Now, he was an employee who worked for Dale Mann. We mentioned him a couple episodes back and how there was a trial for him murdering one of his referees. He was a promoter in the Kentucky area back in the, you know, back in the 80s, 70s, and so on. Um, so Jonathan Dobbs gave his side of things, which actually turned out to not really teach us a whole lot of new information. I thought it was a little vague, but uh, I appreciate the fact that he wanted to come out there and testify or test a lie or whatever he did. And uh, <laughs> so anyway, it's great to get a real, his accent was terrific, you know, and I miss that Kentucky accent. I love, I think it's a great uh, way to express yourself. And most of our listeners don't talk like that. So it's nice to hear it once in a while. That's homespun Kentucky talk. Absolutely. And by all accounts, Dale Mann was a good person. It was in self-defense, according to the law. And, you know, Jonathan painted a nice picture of him. And as far as we know, the situation with the referee was out of self-defense in regards to upset over a payout or a girl. Again, that's where the vagueness comes in. But go to last week's show, listen to that interview, listen to our talk with Sean Waltman. You're not going to be disappointed. Well, I always liked Dale Mann, and I'm glad he never had to defend himself against me. Because, bam, <laughs> that'd be rough. You didn't want to complain to him about a payout or a girl. No, I think uh, those are crimes of passion. So, you know, it's, if, if, it isn't everything about sex and money. If it wasn't for that, there wouldn't be any crimes. Except for vandalism, which has nothing to do with either. But I never really caught on to that. Yeah, love and greed is the source of many deaths over the ages. Now, on the 5th of December... We lost a legend in the ring, Dynamite Kid. He's got a bit of a checkered past outside of the ring, but by all accounts, he has been an influence on so many professional wrestlers. He brought so much athletic ability to the ring that was not really seen before him. What are your memories of Dynamite Kid, Tom Billington? Well, the British Bulldogs were really fun people, okay? They were mischief, mischievous, but they were fun. And they were always cracking wise and having fun and you know, sometimes too much fun, but um, I tried to, you know, to see him in the locker room was always fun. You know, their their locker rooms were, um, I can't explain it, but they were, um, they were just trying to have a good time. Um, some of the cruelty involved, eh, you know, that was ribbing, okay? Calgary was famous for ribbing, and I could go on and on. There was a thing called Maybell Ribs. Um, well, your first time in the territory, you come to Calgary, there might be a really pretty girl that takes an interest in you. So you and a friend who's also in on it go to a house and uh, they start. Uh, then a man comes out there and says, what are you doing with my daughter? And then, <laughs> you know, come, chases you with a gun and then bam, bam. And then the guy that's with you, um, he pretends like he got shot. So he takes the fall. And so... You run miles and, you know, oh, man. My father told me, you better not work in Calgary there. You have a Maybell rib. And he told me all about it. You know, isn't that a little bit of an unusual rib? It's unusual, but actually quite funny. Who fell for that rib? Everybody. 
Okay, I don't know. You know, I can't name names, but uh, that's a bad rib. And a lot of people tore their Achilles tendons running from this old man. Like, you know. <laughs> Crazy father chasing you out with a gun. Oh, man. And the funny part is uh, when the other wrestler that's in on it falls like he got shot, it's amazing. Everybody leaves that guy and just tries to, you know, uh, save themselves. Nobody rescues the guy. You know, so I don't have names, but this is the kind of hijinks that I tried to avoid. Right. And um, let's talk about Dynamite Kid. Tommy Billington, uh, you know, it was a rough ending for him. Um, he divorced and left and whatever and child uh, neglect and whatever. Now, here's another name we're not allowed to say, but on the Genius Cast, we can say anybody. Chris Benoit was nuts about Dynamite Kid, okay? And he right. copy, he copied his style. And if you watch some of Chris Benoit's matches, you can see that his hero was the Dynamite Kid, Tommy Billington. And in my opinion, they changed the business for the better, both of those guys, you know? And, and uh, to make it more athletic, to make it more believable, um, you have to give it, give it to those guys that they really did that. Unfortunately, they paid a severe price physically and emotionally and whatever. That diving headbutt, you know, how many times can can you do that without rattling your brains? Did you ever have a chance to be in the ring with him? Never, because I was a baby face. When they were baby faces, when I turned heel, they were gone. Mm -hmm. So, um, if, you know what? If you get a chance, go on YouTube and get Macho Man Randy Savage against Dynamite Kid in Chicago, the only time they ever worked, and it was a uh, tournament. And uh, the winner gets to go against the uh, Junkyard Dog. And they went on the, it was the first time anybody went on the top rope to do a suplex. And then when he goes for the pin, Randy catches him one, two, three. So at that time, it was the most athletic, daring thing you've ever seen. Uh, but now, of course, everybody does that. But they were the first ones that that I know of. And also, while you're at it on YouTube, check out the incredible classic with Tiger Mask for the WWF Junior Heavyweight Championship. Many consider that to be the match that's one of the greatest of all time. Have you seen that match? Not only did I see it, I stole the moonsault from that match. That was the match I saw when I said, wow, this is great. And I said, so I decided to steal whatever I could. You know, people credit me with inventing the moonsault. Come on. I didn't invent no moonsault. I stole it from that match. So, and I must say that uh, not only was I not an innovator, I was not a perfectionist because my, my moonsault was not as good as Tiger Mask's. Which is okay because Tiger Mask was one of the best in this business. And you, you watch this match, especially for the younger generation of fans who maybe haven't seen this. You go in thinking, all right, we're looking at a match from 1982. I don't know what to expect, but it's fast paced. It's exciting the whole way through. They were innovators way ahead of their time. And, you know, I actually saw Tiger Mask when I was in Japan, but it was like the fourth Tiger Mask. Right. Um, you know, they just carry on that. But the Jushin Liger, it was the same guy. That's right. And the hits keep coming. Uh, the day after Dynamite Kid passed away on the 6th of December, the world learned of the loss of Larry the Axe Hennig. Now, Larry was the father of Mr. Perfect Kurt Hennig, as well as grandfather to WWE's Curtis Axel. Did you know Larry that well? I met him a few times when I was younger through my father. Um, I never really got to know him. Uh, I was in Tower, Minnesota uh, this summer, and uh, I walked over to him and he uh, he seemed a little disorientated. Um, mm. So I was just, I paid my respects. I'm Angelo Poffo's son. My name is Lanny. And he shook my hand. And um, I don't really know if he remembered me or anything. Um, but I believe he had five children. And when I was teamed up with Mr. Perfect Kurt Henning, he always spoke of his father very lovingly. And uh, it was a very tight family and you know, how everybody gets divorced. He never did. And he could have been a bigger star if he had left Minnesota, you know, and gone all over the world like Harley Race did. But um, he didn't. He wasn't uh, interested in that. He stayed in Minnesota, raised his family, and he loved Minneapolis. Just like his son and grandson, he was a uh, champion wrestler as well as uh, played football. 
And he had five children. We sent our condolences to his family. That's right. And I'd also like to put a shout out there. Uh, I just woke up with the news in Venezuela that Jose Castillo and Luis Albuena were killed last night in an automobile accident in Venezuela. They were former major leaguers in their 30s. So you know what? You never know who's next. No, you don't. We send our condolences to their family as well. That's right. Boy, are we excited about this week's show. Yes, Bill Apter, my very dear friend, William Stanley Bill Apter, born October 22nd, 1945. If you don't believe me, Wikipedia the guy. I'm reading it now. And, <laughs> you know, he was a magazine guy, and now he's a podcast guy, and he's doing better than ever. And what an interesting interview it was. Yeah, I mean, he is one of the best in regards to wrestling journalism with his photography. He's interviewed everyone in the business. He's contributed a lot to Pro Wrestling Illustrated over the years. And you mentioned his podcast, The After Chat, is really worth checking out. You can go ahead and find them on all of your podcast apps and just search After Chat. He'll get more into talking about what he's up to with that. But really interesting guy. I mean, what I love is when we get a guest on our show... And they show so many different sides of them that you never even knew were there. He loves singing. He's always cracking jokes. And we're going to bring you that interview now. Hello, this is Lenny Poffo. The Lenny Poffo, the Genius Cast? The Genius Cast, yes. Well, I'd love to be part of the cast. How do I get in there? Well, you have to wait by the phone. <laughs> Make a date for 10 p.m. and then wait for 9.59. Well, you've got to wait by the phone and, and, and you have to get to 9.59 and sounded like Stan Laurel. And Oliver Hardy. You certainly would. <laughs> Hello, my friend. How are you? Oh, man, it's great. I'm glad to have you on the Genius Cast. Can you believe it? Well, I, uh, you know what? Hearing is believing. Bill Apter is one of the greatest entertainers, and a lot of the fans don't even know that because they think you're the magazine guy. Well, I, I am. The, the best, I'm best known for that, but people don't know that during my magazine days and before that, I started out wanting to be um, a singer and entertainer. You wanted to entertain? I did. I did. Um, I, my parents used to... Uh, I uh, used to stand me up in front of their uh, their friends and, hey, Billy, sing, or Billy, tell some jokes. That's what I wanted to do originally before uh, anything in pro wrestling entered my mind. You know, my favorite Billy Crystal movie was Mr. Saturday Night. How many times have you seen that? Oh, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Many, many, many times. That was more, of course, about uh, him being a, a comedian. and uh, But my thing was more of just... Um, you know, somebody needed an MC, uh, like the old variety shows. I could come out and sing a song and introduce the acts, and then during the middle of the show, come out and do a ballad or a fast song or something, and do something with one of the guests. Kind of like the old variety shows that I that I really miss not being on TV anymore, except the reruns, of course. Yes, but the question is, can you imitate Jerry Lewis? I don't know why you asked me that, Sam. <laughs> why did that even come? You, I'm, I'm hoping a lot of your uh, listeners here on the Genius Cast are genius enough to know who Jerry Lewis was. Because when I was growing up, when I was growing up, the team of, team of Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis was my favorite entertainment pair. Well, we have a young demographic here, but um, I insist that they learn who Jerry Lewis is. So go ahead with your shtick. Well, but Jerry Lewis, of course, was, um, in my opinion, the character that he played, which was what we would call a schlub. <laughs> he always played, he always played a little underdog, and he, he was uh, uh, he produced his own movies, he starred in his own movies, he directed his own movies. Um, he was an all-around entertainer. I saw many. I met him probably three or four times, and he had a reputation for not being nice. And uh, two or three of the times that I met him, he was uh, he wasn't the nicest guy in the world when I wanted to talk to him about uh, show business. But when he found out that I 
did photography like I did with the wrestling magazines. Uh, we talked because he was a big, uh, uh, he always had cameras with him. He always wanted to do photography and uh, cinematography. So we were on the same level in terms of interest with that kind of thing. So, yeah, he just became uh, um, that entertainer that I wanted to be. I kind of saw my my uh, entertainment wishes wanting. I, I've kind of a, kind of a makeup, Lanny, that I, I never really told you about. That, but my entertainment career was made up of. Um, let's see, Jerry Lewis. Um, it was an actor, singer, writer, producer uh, named Anthony Newley. Do you know who that was? Oh yes, uh, I I really love the uh, Doctor Doolittle. Yes, he was in he was in Doctor Doolittle. He played Matthew Mugg, Doctor Doolittle's right hand man. But he also wrote two Broadway shows called uh, the first one "Stop the World, I Want to Get Off," and the second one called "The Roar of the Grease Paint, The Smell of the Crowd." And out of those two shows, some of the greatest standard songs in history uh, that every singer, every easy listening singer, sang. His songs like What Kind of Fool Am I, uh, Who Can I Turn To, Going to Build a Mountain, Once in a Lifetime. And he also wrote the song, uh, Sammy Davis's big hit, The Candy Man. Do you remember that song? I sure do. Give me a bar of it. Come on. Bo, wrap it in a sigh. You got it. Cover... <laughs> okay. Got it. And I don't, I don't mean to compete with you, but... No, um... you, that, that was great. Well, when Sammy Davis did it. Go ahead, go ahead. In 1985, when I first joined the WWE, about the, the second time I was there, um, and I wrestled Terry Funk my second time, um, and uh, we tore the house down, but it wasn't me, it was him, because he was the man. And so it takes two to tango. Well, I was his tango. Bobby Shane told me that. I was his tango partner. Bobby, The late Bobby, Bobby Shane that died yes. in the plane yes. crash? Yes, yes. What a, what a horrible thing that was. Yes, um, yeah. So anyway, that night, well, I got there, I used to get there early to the garden, and another guy that was early to the garden, and I recognized him as Marvin Hamlish. Oh, sure, sure. sure. And you know, I fawned all over him, of course, and um, he says, Lanny, do you think the other wrestlers would sign my book? And I said, what do you care? You are Marvin Hamlish. You are better than them. Yeah. You should sign their book. That's what you're right. He's, and he says, no, I'm nothing. You know, he, he wrote um, many, well, if you go on Wikipedia, oh my God, this guy is heavy, heavy, heavy. And uh, he died about, I don't know, five, eight years ago, whatever. But, uh, and Jerry Lewis died this year. Well, now I'm going to tie that in with you because my, I was on vacation, just going on vacation with my uh, wife to uh, Nashville. And we got to Nashville and we were walking downtown and I'm looking, I said, I don't believe this. What? The adaptation of The Nutty Professor, Jerry Lewis's greatest work, the musical, was uh, getting a tryout in Nashville. And Lewis was there, and I met him, but he wasn't starring in it, of course. Uh, and the songs were written by Marvin Hamlish. It was the last thing he ever did. Is that right? Yeah. It was a chorus line that uh, Marvin Hamlish wrote, and that yeah. was the longest-running play on Broadway, and then it got defeated by Andrew Lloyd Webber with Cats. Yes. And then that got defeated by Andrew Lloyd Webber with Phantom of the Opera. Correct. So so uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber is first, second, and uh, Marvin Hamlish is third. And um, one singular sensation, every little step she takes. Da -da 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 -da. And one. then, what I did for love. Same show. The oh, great man. Show. But the, the newly, well, getting back to newly now, see, Sammy Davis had the big hit song on the Candy Man, and I always used to do an imitation of Sammy Davis, and I got to do it for him one time. Because anytime he said a word with ooh, it would sound, he'd go, who can take the sunrise, sprinkle it with you, you. See, he always rolled the oohs. He had another song, nothing to do with newly. He'd do, um, Nobody gives a damn for what I say or do, but you know, I always, because I like to mimic. I can, you know, I imitate a lot of the guys' voices. 
and uh, a lot of the wrestlers, but I also did it with celebrities, and uh, I made Sammy Davis laugh when I uh, did that imitation for him. So those were two of my heroes, Jerry Lewis, Anthony Newley. Then there was a guy who had a, a weekly variety show on TV. Do you remember Andy Williams? Absolutely, and uh, he passed away a couple of years ago. He did. He didn't. He was my uh, uh, he was my singing hero. And what was his What was his number one song? Moon that, River. That's right. If you go to YouTube and you put in Bill After Raps Moon River, you'll see my rap version of that song. And I believe um, <laughs> that song was from the uh, Moon River that came out from the movie Breakfast at Tiffany's, and Correct. that was from the book by Truman Capote. Correct. And it starred Audrey Hepburn. And, and George uh, Pappard. Yeah, and Andy Williams had never... Uh, they just asked him to sing that on the Academy Awards, and it became an instant uh, hit. Then there was a guy named Steve Lawrence. Did you ever hear of him? Absolutely. Steve Lawrence and Edie Gourmet. Yes, they were a great singing duo, but Steve was a, a brilliant single singer um, as well. Had many hits, was totally underrated. Um, and uh, uh, see, I'm, I'm trying to give you a mixture of everything that I wanted to be in the... If I can interrupt you one second, because I, Please. you know, I'm, you know, Mr. Perfect and I used to go to the ring with bum 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 bum, which is, which is the theme from, um, the theme Exodus. from Exodus. Yes. Okay, and Andy Williams, uh, you know, he he was one of the people that had a hit from yeah. Exodus. Come it's on the Moon River album. Come take my hand and walk yeah. this land with me. It was on the Moon River album, one of the mm -hmm. Moon River and other great movie hits. It's one of my favorite albums. Because a lot of the people that are fans of Mr. Perfect, you know, they don't know that that song that we went to the ring had lyrics. And uh, now they know. That did. And then uh, there was uh, Tom Jones. I was a huge fan of him. He was one of the greatest showmen. Everybody, you know... Uh, the stuff that he did with the wiggling and all that kind of stuff and all that, that was all show shtick. He had an incredible voice. And he still does. I saw him in person at the Tower Theater in Philadelphia two years ago. And he does a lot of gospel music now, but wow, his voice is magnificent. Yeah, he had a, he's from Wales. Uh, he's yes. a Welshman. Yes, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here in... Wells, Unamiti, Dominic Bobamsa. It's like, yeah, I, I was a big fan of this. So all of those people are all uh, ingredients of uh, made up who I wanted to be growing up. And then there was uh, Nature Boy Buddy Rogers and Antonino Rocca and Cowboy Bob Ellis. That's when wrestling started coming into my life. Um, that was... Uh, uh, that was the other part of, see, back then, and you know this, the word entertainment and pro wrestling did not exist with each other. You wouldn't say, oh, that was an entertaining match. You'd say, it was a good match. That was a tough match, right? Mm -hmm. That's true. You're from the kayfabe era. Yeah, well, kayfabe. No, I definitely, definitely uh, uh, from that era. But as you know, uh, I, I moved on. You have to if uh, you want to stay in the business. But um, I still, several nights a week, I'm down in Aptor's Alley where I have all my memorabilia and I have a, uh, a singing room down there with probably two, three hundred songs that I know. I have, you don't, I don't know if I ever told you this, but in my wallet, I have a flash drive with about 60 songs, uh, backgrounds, song backgrounds, karaoke backgrounds. Mm -hmm. So when I go to... Uh, any place that has music or looking for entertainment or something, here's my flash drive. Pop it in. I did it uh, at uh, Wrestle, uh, Kate, WrestleCast, StarCast, rather, at um, uh, in Chicago uh, recently. I did Barry Manilow. He's the other guy, Barry Manilow. He's the other guy uh, that goes in with that whole group because he brought the, he brought the love songs back. And I always loved that kind of music. That was September 1st, and I saw you there, and uh, I was very happy to see you there. And uh, I was just very, very lucky, and I owe it all. It, it's just amazing. I've told this story before on the podcast, but um, 
I went to the WrestleCon in New Orleans for the um, WrestleMania adjunct uh, with Mark Brown. Uh, he happened to be sitting right next to me. And we talked, and he said he is in the, he's a TV producer for Ring of Honor. And he gives me the, um, the email address of Hunter Johnston, who is the booker. So I wrote him a note, and I said, if you need me for Lakeland, it's an easy drive for me. And then the next thing you know, um, thanks to a very dear friend of mine, who is Jay Lethal, uh, he decides to bring back the Macho Man and bring me as the brother oh. from another mother. And that's how I got that break. And then Matt and Nick Jackson, they come up to me so politely. And they say, would you be in our being the elite? And I said, are you out of your mind? You don't have to ask. You just tell me. I said, <laughs> I, I, I'm coming to you directly from the couch. And uh, I would love to be on your show. He said, well, would you mind saying this and this and doing that? I said, don't ask. Tell me. I am... I would love to be on it. So in episode 101, Being the Elite, it was called Premiere. And I got to do a little shtick, a little cameo, a little something. And then um, what happened was September the 1st, I wasn't on the card. So Jay Lethal says, I have an idea. Can you fly yourself in and get a room? I said, sure. And um, so I put my credit card. He says, keep the receipt. I'll see what I can do. But there's no guarantee. So I fly myself in, I get a room two nights, and um, about a month later, I just want to say this because there's a lot of people with no integrity in wrestling, but Matt and Nick Jackson, the Young Bucks, they send me a letter with a check in it for more than reimbursing me, and you know, I'm, and I'll tell you what, Mr. Bill Lafter, it touched my heart that they would even do that because you know I didn't draw that crowd. You know those fans would have had just as much fun without me, and nobody even wanted to see me, okay? But I wanted to be there, and uh, I cannot believe not only they reimbursed me, but they gave me a very, very generous payoff. Well, you know what? Now that you brought them up, the my podcast that I do with uh, my co-host Josh Chernoff this week, and it's all over YouTube and everywhere, we awarded the Young Bucks, the After Chat magazine, I'm sorry, the After Chat Wrestling Podcast uh, Tag Team of the Year, the Young Bucks. And we gave wow. them plaques, and it's on YouTube. If you go to the, uh, uh, to the After Chat on uh, YouTube, you can see the uh, plaque presentation. And a few weeks before that, we presented uh, uh, Cody Rhodes, uh, the American Nightmare, with the uh, Male Wrestler of the Year Award. He certainly deserved it too, and what a and what a nice person. Oh, absolutely! But we just had, taking you back to the Young Bucks, since you mentioned them, they're two of you know when people talk about uh, professionals and the business, they are two extremely uh, highly professional young guys who have a great future, and they're uh, uh, they're deserving of everything good that comes their way. Well, I want to say something nice about Cody Rhodes. If you will. I was at the funeral of Dusty Rhodes. Yeah, I saw you there. And, okay, did Cody Rhodes, did he or did he not give the finest eulogy ever? Oh, it was, it was uh, chilling. It was fabulous. I don't want to ruin it for anybody, but this is what I gained from it. You know, at the finish, which is, as you know, a lousy match can be saved by a great finish. Just like... Right. Even a bad movie can be saved by a great finish, as long as it's not so bad that the people are leaving. You see what I mean? As long as they hang around for it. Well, Cody Rhodes, you know, talking about his father, and he's choked with emotion. And he says, and tonight, when you go to bed, don't just have a dream. Have an American dream. And I said, and I had to go see him, and I said, hey, that was the greatest eulogy ever and he points to brandy and he says well that's who wrote it wow. and you know and i said wow you know i said well she may have written it but you delivered it wow i didn't know that i didn't know that she wrote it and it was just just like him not to take credit you see what i mean because uh, when you really got class you don't have to no not at all not at all not at all 
So your, uh, I've been listening to your podcast, by the way, and I'm very, very impressed. And last week on my podcast, actually this week, if you tune in this week, we were thinking of you because I have dozens and dozens and dozens, maybe a few hundred uh, old classic interviews that I did on cassette tapes that I digitized a lot of them. And the one we had on last week was four and a half minutes of one of the original fabulous kangaroos of Al Costello and Roy Heffernan. Uh, I ran my interview with Al Costello, and he did two poems that he wrote, two original poems that he wrote. That was the, uh, uh, he was very famous for that. And of course, we thought of you immediately. I was very dear friends with Al Costello, and he used to come over and visit my father a lot because, you know, they were both retired and in Florida. And, you know, they were the last two standing, you know, the last two of that generation. Yes, yeah. And uh, Al Costello, I remember he recited a poem about uh, prejudice, you know, growing up in Australia. That's and the, the one that I think, oh, no, I'm sorry, that's not the one, but I have that on, a, on an audio tape. Go ahead. About, you know, when he grew up in... Uh, in Australia, and um, he's talking about how because he was an athlete, the prejudice just disappeared. You know, I, I can't recite it for you, but I remember it was poignant and pithy and very good. And, you know, I'm a genuine uh, aficionado of the spoken word and poetry. I and, know you are. And, you know, uh, I'll just admit this right now. As Leaping Lanny, I stole my gimmick from Al Costello. Because they made me the Poet Laureate, and I said, there's got to be something I can throw to the people, because my brother and I were some, when we were boys, we used to scamper for the boomerangs that uh, Al Costello and Roy Hefferman would throw. And, um, of course, they came to the ring with real boomerangs carved by an aborigine, but yeah. you can't throw that because they're going to kill somebody. <laughs> but these are cardboard um boomerangs and they have pictures of Roy Hefferman Al Costello yeah I have one I have one actually that doesn't surprise me a bit but information about the uh, kangaroos and everything and what a great and I remember they they said they've been to every place they've been to Salon uh, and uh, of course that's now Sri Lanka which is the island underneath India but you know this is how old they were <laughs> okay so they used to throw those things and I said if there was only I can't throw boomerangs because I'm not Australian. Nobody, you know, it wouldn't get over. I said, there's got to be something I can throw. And then it hit me. Frisbees. Frisbees. Right, then, right. So that's when I bought 500 Frisbees and had poetry printed on them. And then I threw that to the audience. And then right when it was getting lean and I was about to buy it again, um, the man in charge of marketing for the WWE um, said, is it okay if we um, market these? I said, Oh, I would love for you to. And then every time they had, okay, every time I would go to a town, win, lose, or draw, after I would wrestle, I would go to the venue and sign Frisbees. And they used to charge them $3 a piece. I'd get a nickel, but that wasn't the deal. I was trying to prove I was marketable. And, oh, sure, sure. And you know something? I'm not the best wrestler you ever saw, but nobody is nicer to the fans than Lanny Poffo. And I, even if they didn't buy a Frisbee, I'd be nice to them. I'd be nice to them, be nice to them. Because one of, I saw an interview with the richest man in the world, Sam Walton, who had Walmart foods. Yes, Walmart, I mean, Walmart, and, uh, Sam, Walmart uh, and Sam's Club. Walmart and Sam's Club. And uh, he was the richest. They said, how does a guy from Bentonville, Arkansas, become the richest man in the world? And he says, two rules. Sell for less and be nice to people. So I wrote that down and I said, well, I can't sell for less because it's not me making the price, but I can be nice to people. And you know what? Nobody. And he says, he says, what do you do when you hire a person? Do you train them to be nice? He says, no, I don't train them to be nice. I hire nice people. Yeah. Because you, you yeah. cannot train a person to be nice. No, you can't. And I have uh, uh to justify what you just said during the day for the past 12 years, beside doing the uh, wrestling stuff full time, I work for a nonprofit uh, in Pennsylvania, 
uh, called AHEDD, A-H-E-D-D. Don't ask me what it's an acronym for because it's too long. So they just changed it to AHEDD. And uh, the, we help people with disabilities to find jobs and job coach people, etc. And Walmart is one of the best employers uh, for persons with uh, disabilities in terms of the way um, that they're more open to hire persons with disabilities and more uh, apt to uh, make sure they look out for, well, you know, this guy or this girl is really good. Let's move them up in the company. So, yeah, they're the, yes. They're, so I had to get that in since you mentioned Walmart. Oh, and it's something I got to get in because you mentioned that you were crazy about Nature Boy Buddy Rogers and uh, oh, yeah. Argentina Rocca. Yes. Well, I had the, I, I never met Rocca in my life. Uh, my father was friends with him and they spoke Italian together because he was in from Treviso, Italy, and uh, then via uh, Buenos Aires, Argentina. Argentina, and, yes, yeah. But, but he was first from it, Italy and then from Argentina, and then. He was in. <laughs> I'm laughing because I know where. where get, go go with your thought, and then we'll talk about what I know you where you know that from. Go ahead. Okay. Well, you know, and my father, um, he's he was born in Chicago. His parents were Italian, but they spoke the Northern Italian from Luca. You know, and that was it's the Italian that's taught in the schools. There's about a hundred kinds of Italian, and uh, some of it is butchered, and. Um, but the high class Italian is what's taught in the schools. They're trying to get everybody to speak the same Italian. I never met Rocca. My dad was friends with him. But uh, thanks to George Scott, we all got together with Buddy Rogers. Okay. Nature Boy Buddy Rogers, right before he passed away. Yeah. I knew Buddy very well. And he told story after story after story, and we enjoyed the hell out of it. One of the stories he told is that there were two guys that. Uh, Vince McMahon Sr. had that were undefeated. <laughs> Buddy Nature Boy Rogers and uh, Argentina Rocca. And neither one of them wanted to lose. So <laughs> um, Buddy Rogers, uh, you know, wants to go over and so does Rocca. So they have an impasse, all right? <laughs> so, um, so Buddy Rogers is a tremendous con man. You know, any very charming guy. You know what I mean? And Raka is Mr. Sincerity. And, you know, he says, okay, Raka, don't worry. I'm going to put you over. We're going to do two out of three falls. I win the first fall. You win the second fall and the third. So he goes out there and Buddy Rogers defeats Raka the first fall and leaves. <laughs> Rocca is standing in the middle of the ring. He says, what the hell happened? He just did a job for Rocca. So that's that's a hilarious story. And uh, I'm bringing it to the Genius Cast. I want to tell you, when you, you talked about Rocca first being from uh, Italy and Argentina, uh, we have a very dear uh, mutual friend. The daughter of, uh, yes, the daughter of the great Pompeo Furpo. Oh, yeah, I'd love to imitate his voice. And the, oh, yeah, of course, we know where Randy Savage... Mary Catchmanian Fright, Freeze, and yeah. um, lovely person. And uh, you have you met her in person or just on the uh, Skype? Um, I Just on Skype, but the reason I'm bringing this up is last week uh, we ran this uh, interview I did with Furpo in Detroit back in the 70s. And uh, I said to him... Uh, uh, and this is in the 70s, he said, you know, Raka is wrestling again. He said, where is he staying? I said, why? He says, Antonino you know, Raka, he's a renegade. He said, why? He says, first, he says, I'm proud to be an Italian. Then he says, I'm proud to be Argentina. You know where I think he's from? He's crazy. So it was just, uh, he said, it, just to hear Furbo talking about Raka like that. And uh, it made me think, uh, of that, because I know that uh, uh, Furbo's daughter um, had you hear that interview. So that's as soon as you said that, yeah. I'll tell you what, um, she found me from my website, okay? And she says, I am the daughter of uh, Pampero Furbo, Juan Kochmanian. And I knew who he was, you know. Uh, I had, I met him in Hawaii when I was 12 years old. He was always very nice to me. And then we traveled together in when I was working for the Sheik in 1974. And then, you know, 
I, we've done time together and I've thought he was a fascinating person. And he told me that it was Raka that decided that um, Furpo belonged in, you know, he it was Raka that was instrumental in helping Furpo get out of Argentina. And because he did that, Furpo was able to get his entire family out of Argentina and settle them into the United States and have a better life. Yeah. And he, so he loves Raka. And, um, but they had a lot of uh, matches together, but that was, you do a great Furpo. And he, but let me, before, before you take the ball, I have to tell you something. When Mary uh, Furpo's daughter emailed me, I was just being polite with her because I thought, my God, how ugly does she have to be? <laughs> you know uh, what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, she's Furpo's daughter. I said, yes. I pictured her like a bearded woman. You know, like, <laughs> so did I. And, and then... She sends me a picture of herself holding up a Maine Coon, which is like a large kitty cat. You know yeah, what a Maine Coon yeah. is? I do. She used to, so she she has this big cat, this feet are just about touching the floor when she holds. And I see her f- picture and I said, my God, how does Furpo get a daughter that beautiful? I don't know. I said the same thing. She, as we say back in... Uh New York, she's gorgeous. <laughs> See, at first I was just being polite to her because I figured she was oogly. Yeah. And then when I saw her picture, I went, hamada, hamada, hamada. <laughs> oh, I know. I know. I did I not know. Ex- you do not expect Furpo's daughter to be beautiful. No, absolutely not. No, she's a total knockout. And that, see, there you go now. You said hamada, hamada, hamada. How many of your uh, listeners, uh, how many geniuses out there know where that comes from? Ralph Cramden, the Jackie Gleason show. Uh, no, I know you would know, and I know that too. Yes. But, uh, but, but getting back to Mr. Furpo. When I met him, he couldn't have been, uh, when I saw him as a kid, he had those three words, kill, murder, destroy. And uh, I was scared of him when I was a kid. And we were on on our podcast this week, we did a a section where we asked fans to send in their, uh, their tweets about wrestlers who scared you. And I remember when I was a, a kid, Brute Bernard, Skull Murphy, Pompero Furpo all scared me. Who scared you? Brute Bernard, I'll tell you why. <laughs> because it's, it's not what you're thinking. And Wild Bull Carrot Curry, by the way, too. Oh, my God, yeah. Um, here's how Brute Bernard scared me. Okay. I was working for the Sheik, and Brute Bernard was being managed by Sir Dudley Clemens or Oliver Clemens, one yes, of the two. Yes, yes, yeah. Okay, and they were they used to do drugs on the car, okay? And um, they're both deceased now, so I, I can say it, okay? <laughs> they I guess they were I guess they were wrestling in Van Wert, Ohio, and then they they were off the beaten track. They weren't they were trying to get back to Toledo, but they were going the wrong way. Finally they got in a car wreck and uh Brute Bernard was seriously injured and Clemens died. So about a year later I will, I, I'm, I'm working for the Crockett's in uh, North Carolina, and I see Brooke Bernard. He said, Miss sure, can I drive with you? Can I travel with you? I said, sure, come on in my car. And then about, I don't know, three hours into it, he says, Miss sure, <laughs> would you like me to drive? And I said, no, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> Jesus. You know, because he was the driver, and he killed, his, he killed Clemens. Oh, yeah, I said, yeah. I said, Geez, I would rather sleep at the wheel than let him drive, you know? Uh, really, really. I No, I totally get that. That was one of the things when I first started at the magazines that um, Mr. Weston, my uh, my mentor, my boss, uh, said to me, He said, and he always sounded like this. He says, I don't want you flying in any small planes that the wrestlers fly in, and if you can avoid driving with them, don't drive with them either. I always drove with them. I, I love because part of the initiation in the business, as you know, even though I wasn't an in-ring wrestler or performer or whatever they call it, a uh, sports entertainer today, uh, you learn the ropes. You, know, you learn so much for your trade, riding in the cars with, with the guys. You learn things that you can't pick up anywhere else, right? That's right. That's right. Now, Bill, about uh, 20 minutes ago, you mentioned Bobby Shane. 
Now, were you friends with him, and do you know anything about his plane wreck? And uh, you must know a lot. Well, yeah, I, I had uh, I, I have a, an audio interview that I did with him that I think may be online on YouTube when I ran it years ago, and it'll definitely be on uh, my podcast. Um, but I met Bobby for the first time. We, Mr. Weston was enamored with Bobby Shane and Miss Sherry. Uh, he absolutely loved putting them in the magazines. And when I met Bobby, he, I had just started with the magazines back in the early 70s. And uh, he was a go-getter. He wanted to be in the magazines. He used to love people that um, that wanted to self-promote themselves. And Bobby was one of them. And I talked to him many times, and he was one of the first people who smartened me up because I remember being at the Boston Garden and after the matches, he and I, no, actually it was before the matches, it was for lunch, we went out to an Italian restaurant in Boston called Palcari's Restaurant. I think there was Mayor Palcari owned a restaurant back then. We were sitting down and I think he thought that I was already smart to the business and I remember him telling me about good matches and bad matches and that's where, you know, hey, it takes two to tango on there. And so, yeah, we used to talk. We talked a lot, Bobby and I. And uh, he always, he never told me this, but I had found out that he was pretty terrified of flying. So it was a horrible way for him to pass. Oh, brother. Um, Bill, I'm going to have to uh, prompt you to tell a story because one of the greatest things that ever happened to professional wrestling was Andy Kaufman and Jerry Lawler, and you are the man responsible for this. And well, don't be mo don't be modest now. No, you I'm are not. the man. You are the man that opened I, the door. I helped put the key in the uh, ignition. I'm not fully responsible. I'm responsible for the uh, uh, for getting it all together. And thank you. And it is it's in my book. Is wrestling fixed? I didn't know it was broken. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, people do ask me sometimes about the greatest accomplishment that I, I've, uh, uh, stuff that makes me feel good, and this was one of them. So I was backstage at Madison Square Garden one night for a wrestling show, and Andy Kaufman, uh, so you say Kaufman in New York and Philly and all that, it's Kaufman. Um, I always, always uh, laugh when people and I get into that. Oh, it's Kaufman. Oh, it's Kaufman. Oh, it's, uh, um, so he was backstage at the garden one night and I saw him talking with Vince McMahon senior and Vince junior was back there and all this. And then he came over to me. He knew who I was from the wrestling magazines. And, uh, he wanted to be a wrestler. He wanted to be Fred Blassie. He wanted to be Buddy Rogers. I uh, actually, people don't know that I introduced him to Buddy Rogers. I, uh, Buddy at that point was working at the Playboy Club in uh, Atlantic City as a greeter, and I was able to put them together too. And Buddy would call me and say, "Billy, Andy, Kaufman, and I just went out. We were talking about you." Um, I had to get my Buddy invitation in there, by the way. There you go. And by the way, I have an I have a whole hour audio interview with him of his whole life story that I taped in 1979 when he was working for Jim Crockett Promotions. So Andy said to me, um, he can't get in with this wrestling thing. He said, what are you doing after the matches? I said, going home. He said, where do you live? I said, Queens. He said, how do you get there? I said, I take the E train. He says, can I go home with you? Can I come with you? So I've got Andy Kaufman, the guy who is the star, one of the main stars of Taxi, the hottest sitcom on TV at that time riding on the E-train back to my apartment in Queens. I was living at that time for three years with a girl wrestler from Australia by the name of Susan Sexton, who became my best friend. And I walked in, it's probably one o'clock in the morning, and she says, I do, oh, it's, and she used the F-bomb with everything. She said, oh, it's F and Andy Kaufman. What the hell are you doing here, mate? So we sat down for over an hour and we talked wrestling. And finally, after about an hour, she looked at me. She says, is that all you two can talk about? I'm going in my room. And she went into her uh, uh, into her room. She kind of rented my part of a room in my apartment, put on her headphones, listened to the Ramones, gabba gabba hey, and never saw the rest of the night. So I told Andy, I said, listen, I said, 
Vince McMahon is in the showbiz guy, but I have a friend in Memphis, Tennessee, by the name of Jerry Lawler, and he was a little familiar with him from seeing him in the magazine. I said, his promotion, they've got guys like the Frankenstein monster and Dracula. And so your uh, Elvis imitation, which is so dead on, would probably go over great there. So I said, let's call him. He said, well, it's almost 2 o'clock in the morning. I said, he's probably just getting in. It's wrestling people. We're up all night. So called Jerry Lawler. And there were no cell phones or internet back then. We called Jerry Lawler, and he says, you got Andy Kaufman, the guy from Taxi, in your roach-infested apartment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I said, uh, I said, hang on a minute. I put them on the phone, and that's what put the key in the ignition, and Jerry Lawler took it from there. Man didn't want to be show business. You're talking about Vince Sr. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because Vince Jr. is all show business. Oh, yes. Yeah. He's an entertainment person. Absolutely. And uh, you've got to get credit to Jerry Lawler because he is broad minded when he comes to, you know. Oh, I know. I've he, seen the ladies he goes out with. <laughs> no, go ahead. No, I could. Yes. You could talk a lot about that, but we won't. But let's just no. say something nice about Jerry. Oh, um, always. He's one of my best friends in the whole world. I love Let him. me tell you what. He's got more brains in his little finger than a lot of people have in their whole cranium. That is you know? very true. And uh, he's a very, he, he's an artist and he's creative. And um, I don't know, I just saw um, a picture. He he also has a podcast and he's he drew a picture of Shane, Vince Jr. and Vince Sr. together. Did you see that? I did. I did. It was incredible. That was, he's quite see, the artist. See, this is my opinion of art. I have you ever do you know who Al Cap is? I do, of course. He drew uh, Lil Abner. There you I go. I can't believe I remember that, but I can't remember what I had for dinner four hours ago. He drew Lil Abner, and Lil Abner was one of the greatest comic strips ever. And he was on Merv Griffin's show, and at the time we didn't have, you know, uh, recorders or anything, so I was I was watching you know, I knew this was going to be a great interview between Merv Griffin and, and Al Cap and the creator of Lil Abner. And Merv Griffin says, you are considered to be the greatest artist in all of cartooning. Um, my question to you is, who is your favorite artist? And he says, my favorite artist is Norman Rockwell. So he says, well, what do you think about people like Jackson Pollock? And he says, people like Jackson Pollock, they are, you know, that kind of art is painted by the untalented, sold by the unscrupulous, and bought by the utterly bewildered. <laughs> I never so, heard that. So I ran for a pen and I said, created by the untalented, sold by the unscrupulous, and bought by the utterly bewildered. Otherwise, I wouldn't have remembered it. You know, and I said, that's true. I want art to look like the art. You see, but since they invented the photography, everybody said, well, we got to do this and this and this. And now the art sucks. Okay, I like art. If you come to my house, you'll see art, but it's good art. Well, if you come to my house, you'll see art that was done by my mother-in-law, who's still alive in her 90s, and she's an incredible artist. But we were talking about Jerry Lawler and his, you know, he's done comic book covers. But what he did for me, I couldn't, he wanted to thank me and give me money um, for uh, getting him together with Andy Kaufman. And I said, I couldn't do this. And so my daughter's uh, bat mitzvah, the female bar mitzvah, was coming up soon. And she had a theme. Her name is Haley. And she had a theme called Planet Haleywood. And she had Jerry Lawler offered to draw four giant posters of her favorite planets. Uh, the Lucille Ball Show, Planet Candy, Planet Pooh for Winnie the Pooh, and uh, Planet uh, Showbiz. And they're displayed in Actors Alley in my basement here. Uh, and they're just incredible. He had not met my daughter at that point to send him a picture, and the the drawings, the cartoons that he made of her was like this was like he knew her so very well. Wow. He's brilliant. He's brilliant. Oh, yes. Uh, 
let me tell you what. Jerry Lawler, you know, you can't take that away from him. You see what I mean? No. You can't take it away. I wouldn't so, want to. I'm tell you what. I have knocked him on the show. There's a couple of things I didn't like about what he said in the DVD about my brother and my father. Now, okay. the DVD, that was not the time to be critical of my father or my brother who are deceased and not here to defend themselves. And I will defend them. Absolutely. You have every right to and you should. On the other hand, if it wasn't for Jerry Lawler, the macho man wouldn't have got his big break. And if it wasn't for Jimmy Hart and Jerry La and, and, and Jerry Jarrett, okay, the macho man wouldn't have got his big break and I wouldn't have got to tag along and eventually get my break too. So I don't bite the hand that feeds me or fed me. And Jerry Lawler was very, very good to the Poffo family, but he should have continued that trend when he spoke on the DVD because I heard every word and so did my mother. I, that territory... Now that you mentioned that, was I think that may have been the first place I ever met you when I was with uh, uh, Stu Sachs, one of the editors of uh, the magazine, and uh, he was the referee of a match that we staged for the magazine of you against your brother. Absolutely, and you know, people say... I think, was that the first time we met, or did we, did we meet in uh, Toronto before that, when I first met Randy? I believe that was the first time I met you. Yeah. And but before that, in 1974, in Atlanta, I met George Napolitano. Oh, George is a great guy. And the thing was, um, when in September 1st, when um, when Flip Gordon was wrestling against Jay Lethal, Brandy was outside the wife of, um, you know, Cody. Cody Rhodes. And I was walking around. And she sees me and she's you know, like, she sells it a little bit. You know what I mean? And I said, Brandy, I'm a very, very old man. I want no trouble from you and I will give you no trouble. And she says, okay. And then George Napolitano says, what about me? I'm really old. I said, you died three years ago. And I said, nobody had the balls to tell you. And we That's had a right. little laugh about it, you know. But that was George, George Napolitano had his camera in his elbows on the ring, you know what I mean, in, in his basic position. But he gave me my first publicity when I was working for um, Ann Gunkel and Tom Renesto, the, the, wow. the widow of Ray Gunkel. Right. In, wow, in Atlanta. that's great. I didn't know that. Yes. And uh, what a nice person George Napolitano. Sure is. Uh, yes. And uh, we had a little fun, you know, because... Uh, but the thing is, that match was so great. I ceased to be a manager and became a fan, you know, and I and I kept looking behind me and I kept saying, am I in your way? Because I know these tickets are expensive, <laughs> you know, so I kind of scrunched, you know, I don't want to block the view of somebody that paid ringside. Yeah, I know what that's like as being one of the photographers on the ring. I, it wasn't so bad with wrestling, but when I, when I shot, we also did boxing magazines. And when I shot a lot of the, the uh, major fights, like Ali fights and stuff like that, uh, the fans behind me were like, you know, get the F down. We paid $7,000 for this seat. <laughs> Not to look at the bald spot on the back of your head. So I always tell people that, that one of the deadliest things, one of the things uh, after the matches, the boys like to go out and have a beer. And I always, I don't drink. I never liked beer. And somebody asked me, I said, why don't, why don't you like beer? And I said, you know, I just, I don't like the taste of it. I'm a fizzy drinker. I like soda, sparkling ice. Uh, I like these kind of drinks. And then I really thought back about what it was. And it was my early days in the early, real early 70s, late 60s of fans throwing beer toward the ring at the boxers or the wrestlers and the beer never made it to the ring. It always soaked the photographers. And I used to go home on the subway smelling like a beer keg, and I hated it. Mm. I never told anybody on any show that story. The Genius Cast gets the scoop from Bill Apter. Wow. The only one. The only one. Genius Cast, uh, I have a, uh, uh, a genius dog here named Lexi Rose, who at this hour, every night must go for her constitutional. Yes, yeah, so Furpo used to say, 
Excuse me, I have to perform my physiological necessity. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, before... Okay, I'm going to let you go. Bell, you've been a fantastic guest. Oh, no, I Be- enjoy this so much. You know, we're old friends. This is not like you're the host and I'm the guest. This is two friends talking, and I really love it. Well, before you go, can you please sing for our audience? Because you are fantastic. Well, what would you like to hear? I don't know what Something like Big Band. Oh... Why don't you Why don't you pick it? Um, well, you know, on the uh, end of my uh, also, if I can plug, of course, the after chat. My um, you definitely should, and I will um, be on your show anytime you ask. Yes, the the uh, my podcast along with co-host Josh Chernoff, it drops on the Pod Waves uh, every Friday morning, and uh, please become an after chatter. My book is still out there. Is wrestling fixed? I didn't know it was broken. And uh, you can tweet me at after one wrestling, and I'm still at onewrestling.com. And I'm trying to think of a uh, of a, a song. You know, I I end I do a one man show based on my book, and uh, during the show, at the end of the show, I end it doing a very different version of my way. Go for it. It's a tribute to some people, and it starts off with this guy named the American Dream saying, and now the end is near. And so I face the final curtain. My friends, I'll say clear. I'll state my case, of which I'm certain. Oh yeah, I've lived a life that's full. I've traveled each and every highway. But more, oh yeah, more than this, I did it my way. That's a little teaser there. So, but uh, your brother, Randy, is a large part of that song. And then I do, um, my best friend and I entertain at uh, at senior homes. Had I known we were going to do this, I would have done it from Karaoke Central in my basement here. Um, No, do do it a cappella. Do it a cappella. We know you got talent. You you know what I mean? It's just, can you sing Moon River since we discussed it earlier? Of course I can. I can not just sing it. I can rap it if you want to hear that too. Oh, I want you to sing it. I hate rap. All right. I do do rap as crap. But, uh... Moon River wider than a mile I'm crossing you in style Someday Oh dream maker You heartbreaker Wherever you're going I'm going your way To drifters Off to see the world there's such a lot of world to see. We're after that same rainbow's end, waiting round the bend. My huckleberry friend, Moon River, and me. So there's a little moon for you. Acapella. Bill, I hate myself for envying you so much. That fella. No, stop it. But that, uh, uh, I didn't know you, you were going to ask me to do that. I Also, by the way, before we leave, I do a lot of old school, not old, old school, but maybe 15, 20 years back. I love doing country music. George Strait's one of my favorites. Uh, John Michael Montgomery back then. Uh, I always sing in my uh, show. I do uh, uh I swear by the moon and the stars and the sky. I do that song. I do tons of country music, too. I'm a, I'm a city boy who loves country music. You like Johnny Cash, Willie Nelson, Waylon Jennings? No, no, no. I, I liked Willie, but I was more Kenny Chesney. Uh, Neil McCoy, who to me is the greatest country music entertainer ever. How about Furlan Husky? Do you like him? No, no. Too old school. I'm more of the modern type of uh, country. Um... Uh, Keith Urban, uh, you know, more of the, more of the contemporary uh, uh, country. My favorite country group of all time, and please Google this, everybody's a group called Black Hawk. Do you remember them at all? Not a, I have never heard of them. Uh, well, give, give me a song from Black Hawk and then we'll close, because I know your dog has to... It was a, a song called uh, uh, Goodbye Says It All. Um, they did a song called Postmark Birmingham. They're just one of my favorite groups of all time. But you know what? I'll end this with Andy Williams, how he used to end his show. May each day of the week 
be a good day. May the Lord always watch over you. Good night, everybody. See you at the matches. Good night, Bill Lapter, and thank you for being a fantastic guest and a great friend, and God bless you forever, and uh, you call me anytime you need a favor, I'll be there. Two words for you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. What a fun interview that was. Hey, lady. That was him doing Jerry Lewis. <laughs> right. <laughs> I know our fans are going to love what they just heard. And if you want to get more Bill Apter and Lanny Poffo together, check into the Apter chat, and Lanny's going to be a guest on their show really soon. Yes, and I'm looking forward to it. Lanny's about to go on travels. You're off to Canada. Yes, I'm going to Halifax, Nova Scotia. Now, why on earth would I be doing that in the dead of winter? Tell me why. I'll tell you why. Because I'm a whore. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. It seems your um, Alexa is going to be looking up the word whore. No, that's my Roomba. That's my Roomba. Oh, the Roomba. Okay. Yes, yes I, I got myself an early Christmas gift. Yeah, it's going it to clean, clean up the whore stench in your room. The whore stench? Are you <laughs> suggesting that I entertain girls that are not my wife? Well, you're single now, right? I've been single for quite a while, since 1996. There you go. I still have a pulse, but uh, there's no whore stench in my... Ev- all of the women that I entertain are the finest quality and most f- fragrant. <laughs> <laughs> but speaking of whoring, you were mentioning going out to Canada. Let's hear what you're going to be doing out there. Oh, I'll tell you what. It's kind of a surprise. I'm going to be doing a documentary. And um, they asked me to be on it because I, I am part of the history of the Maritimes, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island. Um, Newfoundland came later. I never went there in, you know, that was, we never went to Newfoundland. I never went there until I worked for WWE. And um, it was, I was there in 1978 uh, with my father and my brother. And I was there, I went one more time in 1983. And uh, so that's two seasons, but it was memorable. And I loved every moment of it. And um, it's going to freeze my ass is what it's going to do. But, right. Uh, but I'm going to bundle up and uh, endure it. Absolutely. And it's going to be something that we'll be talking about on our show real soon. Lovely travels. And until next time, why don't you hit us with a bit of poetry to end our show? Let me see. Um, we talked about the fact that uh, my life was influenced because I met Shel Silverstein twice. Mm -hmm. So let me give you a little one from Shel Silverstein. Listen to the mustn'ts. Listen to the don'ts. Listen to the shouldn'ts, the impossibles and won'ts. Listen to the never haves, then listen close to me. Anything can happen. Anything can be. Until next week, so long. So long. Oh, that was wonderful. Thank you for having me on. No, thank you, Bill. You're the greatest. No. You are the greatest of all time. Hopefully I'll see you somewhere. I think so. We always meet. I know. If I'm ever close to Philadelphia, I'll look you up. You have to. I want you to come here down to Actors Alley. You got my number. I do. I used to see your dad on the TVs when he worked for McMahon, when he was the uh, Bronco Lubitsch was his manager. Mm-hmm. I, yeah. I never forgot that. I could still see your... I could still see that the... the puff thing your dad had on his arms. He had a, on his, he had a yeah. muff. A muff. But you know, the genius would never embarrass him. <laughs> 727. Right. Okay, I've got it then. Watch J.P. Zarka, the editor, put that in there and everybody's going to know my number. Oh, of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> no, of he course. wouldn't do that. You wouldn't do that, would you, J.P.? Hey, God bless you, man. Thank you so much. You too. And by the way, your you're, uh, producer is from uh, London, England? Uh, he's actually from Chicago, and he lives in London. Oh, so if he lives in London and he's listening to this, even though there's no payoff, my favorite candy in the whole world is Round Tree Fruit Gums. So if he can send a package of those to me, I would appreciate it. Is that a UK thing? Is that, it is. is that it's a- only UK only. All right. Yes. Okay, hear that, JP? He deserves it. And he should know who Anthony Newley is. Have him look him up. Because do you know one other thing that Newley did? 
that um, he wrote the uh, song, even though it was public knowledge before he wrote this, but he wrote a version of Pop Goes the Weasel. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Go to go to uh, YouTube, put in Anthony Newley, Pop Goes the Weasel. Well, well you, do you know who wrote I Did It My Way? Paul Anka. There you go. There you yeah. go. Yeah. Oh, of course. Of course. See, I couldn't do that in my living room here because my wife's upstairs. And when I do that song, I have a big, I have a Pat Patterson finish. So mm-hmm. I can't. I hope not. I couldn't go there. No, I don't mean to. <laughs> Great line. Great Pat line. Patterson, happy ending. Love you, my friend. God bless. Thank you. Take your dog out. I just want to say not as the genius, not as Leaping Lanny, as Lanny Poffo. Thank you to all the fans that made this genius cast a big success. It's a lot of fun to do. I hope it's fun to listen to. We can't thank you enough, guys. And thank you to everyone who's already left a five-star review on iTunes. Every single one of those is going to help our show grow. If you haven't done so already, you can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at The Genius Cast. We're going to be using those accounts to keep the Poffo family memory alive. We had a lot of fun this week, and we can't wait to bring you a new Genius Cast each Monday, so don't forget to subscribe. I'm J.P. Zarka, and you can find me on Twitter at J.P. Zarka, that's Z like zebra, A-R-K-A. That's it for now. So long and goodbye. You've been listening to the Genius Cast with Lanny Poffo. This has been a ProWrestlingStories.com production. Find them on social media at the Genius Cast, at Lanny Poffo, or at JP Zarka. If you'd like to advertise to thousands of dedicated listeners on the show each week, send an email to the genius cast at pro wrestling stories.com until next time. Oh yeah.